Young Fergus, your drill is the drill that will pierce the singularity. Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. Die here. It's time to continue our lore of Fate Grand Order, progressing through the sub-arc, Epic of Remnant, otherwise known as the Remnant Order. After taking care of Kiara, who proved to be far more dangerous than Zeppar, the demon god who roused her, we're back to searching for the demon gods themselves. Today's singularity, Agartha, takes us on an adventure through various storybook worlds, ruled over and dominated by women, and it's all thanks to a single servant, Scheherazade. You see, there's this anthology of Middle Eastern folk tales collectively known as 1001 Nights, or Arabian Nights as it's sometimes called. While these individual stories were all written by different authors, and over time stories were even added to the anthology, they were presented in an overarching narrative involving the fictional Persian king Shariar. He was a terrible and impatient man who would take a new wife every night and then kill her when done with her. Witnessing this horror, the king's advisor teamed up with his daughters to devise a plan. One of his daughters, Scheherazade, would become the king's next bride and entertain the king by telling stories. These tales included famous characters like Aladdin, Genies, and Ali Baba. She also invited her sister, Dunyazad, to sit in on these stories and show tremendous excitement. In this way, Scheherazade took control of the situation, stopping her storytelling to continue the next day, forcing the king to be patient. He could not kill her so long as he yearned to continue hearing her stories. Thus, these supposed 1001 nights are the amount of nights Scheherazade fought perilously to entertain the king, continuously postponing her execution. While she started this whole ordeal through the brave cause of protecting fellow maidens, her main motivation quickly became all about one thing, not dying. These nights instilled upon her an intense fear of death, never knowing when her stories, her lust, her devotion to an evil king would fall short. In a rather cruel twist of fate, Scheherazade was recorded into the throne of heroes to fight as a servant due to her fame. While many heroic spirits yearned to be summoned for the chance to continue their legacies, she simply saw being summoned as another opportunity to be killed. To her, becoming a heroic spirit meant being condemned to countless deaths, and so she desperately wished to break free of this burden. Thanks to this, the demon god Fenex, who happened to be a god of death and rebirth, sympathized with her. He understood her fear of death and thought they could work together to essentially eradicate the entire servant summoning system. He could use it as an opportunity to destroy the world as Getia had wanted, and she could use it to escape her endless cycle of death. The two devised a plan that would accomplish both tasks. Scheherazade's noble phantasm is Alf Laya Walaya, a reality marble that gives form to the elements in her stories. It's like a storybook come to life. Fenex, as a powerful demon god, was able to strengthen this reality marble to the point where it could manifest as an entire singularity and even draw from stories not included in the Arabian Nights. In this fictional world brought to life, she would summon heroic spirits and encourage conflict, holding a sort of holy grail war. As the servants fought each other and died, their mana would gather, giving Scheherazade enough power to manifest her story world outside the singularity and smash it into a real-life city. This would force humanity to acknowledge the existence of mystery, fantasy, and the supernatural, leading to a world in which the mystical would cease to be mystical. As Syndrome from The Incredibles put it, with everyone super, no one will be. Fenex and Scheherazade believe that doing this will effectively end the process of summoning heroic spirits. Of course, this also means causing a tremendous catastrophe, killing an unprecedented amount of people. But Scheherazade is so afraid of her own death that she'd be willing to do this, completely ignoring the fact that she once bravely put herself in danger for the sake of others. So let's talk about what this storybook world actually looks like. Overall, it takes the form of Agartha, an underground kingdom at the Earth's core, detailed by a 19th century French occultist. Within Agartha, Scheherazade separated the land into various other storybook kingdoms. Among them is Ys, which happens to be a video game series with almost nothing to do with the fictional kingdom. Either way, Ys was a city founded by King Gradlon on behalf of his daughter Dahut, upon land reclaimed from the sea. The prosperous city was protected by a dike, which held back the water and the king kept close the dyke's key. Eventually, however, Tehut got her hands on the key, and thinking she was opening the city's main gate, accidentally released the dyke, flooding the city once more. 
The raging waters came to claim Dehut, who fled on horseback with her father. But in the end, she fell from the horse and was taken by the sea to become a mermaid. Naturally, the city itself was swallowed by the ocean. Next, there is the Peach Blossom Spring, a Chinese fable about a fisherman who accidentally sailed into a hidden utopia where people and animals lived peacefully, unaware of China's violent political climate. Despite leaving signs on his way out, the fisherman could never find the paradise again after his initial visit. Similarly, we have El Dorado, the legendary lost city of Spanish myth. Based on the legend of a village chief who had covered himself in gold dust, El Dorado came to describe a city of gold filled with countless treasures. Going back to Chinese folklore, we have the Nightless City, written in the Book of Han as a city that shined bright even in the dark of night. Beneath all of these cities is the Dragon Palace, or Ryugujo. In its legend, it is an undersea palace home to the dragon kami Ryujin and Princess Otohime. A visitor, Urashima Taro, was once given a magical box called a Tame Tebako to bring back to the surface. At home, Taro discovered time had passed much faster on the outside while he was in the palace, and he desperately opened the Tame Tebako in despair. It transformed him into an old man, trying to fulfill his wish of mediating the time he had lost. While not exactly a kingdom, this palace rests below Agartha's waters, still containing a couple more Tame Tebako, which are more or less vessels of mana like the Holy Grail. All of these locations are meant to serve as the Singularity's battleground, but there is one story meant to succeed them, Lapta, the flying island detailed in Jonathan Swift's novel, Gulliver Travels. For our purpose, it is the vessel Scheherazade plans on using to crash her Singularity into a real-world city. That said, if she's going to be hosting a Grail War, she'll need servants, particularly ones that can rule over these different fictional cities. It's also worth noting that Scheherazade, given her experiences in life, is intimidated by men and subconsciously chooses to make the vast majority of the Singularity's residents female. To rule over El Dorado, she summons the berserker servant Penthesilia. In Greek mythology, Pent was an Amazonist queen who hated Greek heroes such as Heracles for killing her sister Hippolyta. Because of this, during the Trojan War, she and an army of Amazons assisted the Trojans, resulting in Pent dueling with the Achaean hero Achilles. Here, she suffered a humiliating defeat. Not only did she perish to Achilles' spear, she also had her pride as a warrior wounded when Achilles praised her beauty. Thus, as a berserker, she aims to destroy Achilles while ruling over the Amazons of El Dorado. To rule over the nightless city, Scheherazade summoned the assassin servant Wu Zetian, a controversial Chinese empress. In life, she was the daughter of a lowly government official. Her father died, and she was beaten by her other relatives for their amusement. From that sorry state, she decided to become the Empress of China. She studied her ass off, and eventually landed herself a position as a concubine to Emperor Taizong of the Tang Dynasty. When he died, she married his son Gao Zhong. Through manipulation and murder, Wu Zetian eliminated her competition and claimed China as her own. Her method of rule was intimidating. She relied on informants to expose criminals, and she would punish those criminals through brutal torture. It was her earnest attempt to discourage evil, but in practice, she merely made her citizens live in constant fear and submission. To rule over East, Scheherazade wanted to summon Dehut, but it turns out she wasn't famous enough to earn a place in the throne of heroes. Effectively, Dehut was a phantom spirit, as we discussed in relation to Shinjuku. Thus, she needed to be summoned into the body of an actual heroic spirit. To do this, Scheherazade summoned Francis Drake right out from under Caldea to serve as Dehut's body. This is because the two women had similar mentalities toward treasure. Drake seeks treasure to bask in the glory of spending it, whereas Dehut seeks treasure to claim it and then discard it. For Dehut, the process of claiming what she didn't have was most important. Thus, as the ruler of East, she only enforced two rules, that her women seek what they do not have, and that they never want what they've already acquired. In a similar manner, Scheherazade pulled more servants from Caldea to fill the war's roster. Among them, we have Elena Blavatsky, whom I introduced back in America. There's also Heracles, whom I covered in Okeanos. In his case, however, he was summoned into an even stronger, less rational form that we later title Megalos Heracles. After all, she is trying to incite conflict. Because of this, another candidate among Caldea's ranks happens to be Fergus, whom I also covered in America. He's known for being a total womanizer, requiring various women to satisfy his libido. Considering most of Agartha is populated by women, Scheherazade figured he'd be perfect for causing trouble.
She tried to summon him as a teenager, which she assumed to be his peak horniness, but accidentally wound up summoning him as a child. From before a time, he came to see women as formidable foes and targets of his lust. This sucks for him since Agartha is not a safe place for men. You see, the women of Agartha still require men in order to reproduce, not through intimacy but by consuming their energy. These women, whether they're Amazons, pirates, or Chinese torturers, use the men to essentially make copies of themselves. But where do they get these men? Well, this singularity exists below Central Asia in the year 2000, and men living their own lives on the surface above this singularity found themselves being dragged in through holes that opened beneath them. In different ways, the three female kingdoms enslaved these men, using them for manual labor, as tools for amusement, and as subservient escorts. Now that we're talking slavery, there's one more servant needed to complete this cauldron of disaster, Christopher Columbus. The man often credited for reaching the New World during the Age of Discovery was anything but a great man. He was a conquistador who sailed across the Atlantic Ocean on board three different boats, including the Santa Maria, landing on what we currently call San Salvador Island. Discovering new lands meant encountering new people indigenous to those lands, and Columbus saw this as a perfect opportunity to profit. This turned his campaign of discovery into a nightmare of trading, raping and plundering the native people he enslaved. He was the perfect candidate for Scheherazade to summon, because her Agartha was a world where humans, specifically women, could reproduce with ease. Thus, the moment Columbus arrived, he saw the singularity as an opportunity to continue his slave trade. All he has to do is kill the female servants who stand in his way. He pretends to have amnesia and takes advantage of the first servant he encounters, Elena Blavatsky. When she drops her guard, he stabs her and claims the Peach Blossom Spring is his base of operations. While Elena survives this encounter, she is forced to go into hiding while her wounds heal, causing her to miss out on the majority of this singularity. Granted, Columbus's crazed ambition does amount to some good. He begins liberating men from their captivity, using them to form a resistance army against Agartha's women. He teaches them to fight and to survive. It's just too bad that he has such ulterior motives for doing so. Regardless, he manages to fool not only his own followers, but also Caldea. As it turns out, quite a lot of chaos had emerged in the singularity before Caldea detected it in their search for demon gods. As usual, Ritska is sent to investigate, but they're joined by two servants who stow away with the help of one of Caldea's staff, Mr. Manware. One of these servants is Chevalier Dion, whom I introduced back in Orléans. The other is our lovely Astolfo in his debut for this video series. In legend, Astolfo was one of the Twelve Paladins of Charlemagne, the French king whose exploits mirrored that of King Arthur. Astolfo was a loyal paladin and was known for both his wild adventures and reckless personality. This is based in the legend that he rode to the moon and lost a bottle containing his sense of reason. He fell for various traps and spells, one of which caused him to live as a tree for a time. Nonetheless, his different journeys helped him amass a handful of noble phantasms that compensate for his notable weakness. Not only are these two servants a joy to have around, their androgyny is also ideal, considering Agartha's women have it out for men. We can't say the same for young Fergus, who we rescue from a pack of demon boars. He's not comfortable fighting women, but he is able to step back and protect Ritska. We continue on, ultimately finding ourselves surrounded in one of the Amazonist camps. Penthesilia comes to fight and enslave us, but is interrupted by news of Heracles. Throughout this singularity, Pent's rage and hatred for Achilles is so strong that she continues mistaking Heracles for him due to the scent of their Greek blood. She believes Achilles is nearby and abandons the fight to pursue him. While we fend off the remaining Amazons, we are assisted by Columbus, who convinces us he has amnesia and that we should just call him Rider of the Resistance. Da Vinci and Mashu are weary of his behavior, but nonetheless conclude that he's an ally worth fighting for. The way he respects and encourages his crew seems sincere enough. He even takes us to the Peach Blossom Spring, where his army survives by eating the limitless supply of peaches in its trees. Of all the kingdoms to attack first, Columbus suggests Ys because its access to the rivers leads to frequent encounters. So we arrive at Ys and discover it to be a total dump. Living by De Hood's creed, the pirate women of the city covet and dispose of whatever they desire, causing the city to be overrun by trash. We plan on making this a stealth mission, until witnessing some women playing darts using the men as boards. One scores a bullseye in, well, a dude's eye, prompting Ritska to step in. 
We defeat all of the pirates in a bar, except for one who is using the bathroom, and notifies the rest of the town. Thanks to this, we forego stealth and rush straight to Dahoot's Manor. Our fighting goes nowhere, since Dahoot's minions keep cloning themselves. Instead, the feud is interrupted when, during the conflict, Wu Zetian infiltrates the manor and steals the key to the reservoir. She opens the floodgates, putting an end to East just as in the original story. De Hood is carried away by the flood, and we escape back to Columbus's hideout. We assume De Hood's dead and declare the Nightless City to be our next target. Since Estolfo and Deon can both pass as women, they go about the streets in disguise to gather information. They find that the men don't appear to be imprisoned, but are rather allowed to walk alongside women as escorts. Of course, it's quickly revealed that these men are encouraged to rat each other out for their own gain. If a man so much as thinks of criticizing the city or its methods, other men will sell them out to avoid taking the blame. Even the guy we wind up saving from vicious attack dogs turns on us, hoping Wu Zetian will reward him. Thankfully, when we're surrounded by the city's torturers, we can rely on Astolfo and Deon's new alter egos, Sailor Paladin, friend of justice and kicker of butts, as well as Maid Knight, defender of the innocent. <laughs> Obviously, these aren't actual alter egos, like the kind you can summon. Preferring a direct confrontation, Wu Zetian erects her underground facility, Yao Guang Hall, for everyone to see. When we arrive, we find out that Wu Zetian has been relying on Scheherazade as her strategist. It was thanks to Scheherazade that Wu Zetian knew about the key to flooding Yi's. Noting our strength in fighting the torturers, she tries to recruit us as her subjects, but we clearly don't comply. It's back to fighting, but we're again interrupted when Megalos Heracles takes to the city, crashing from the ceiling and crushing Wu Zetian beneath his colossal weight. We assume the Empress is dead and flee, leaving Heracles to have fun ravaging the city. Back at the Peach Blossom Spring, Scheherazade begs us to spare and protect her, as she was only doing what she thought would best keep her alive. Because there's a hint of truth behind it, her lie comes off quite convincing, and we welcome her along to help in our fight against El Dorado. Our initial confidence is blown away when Penthesilia and her warriors begin their war cry, which greatly enhances their strength. We lose half of our forces in the battle before making our retreat. At the base, we learn that the men are losing morale, and that doesn't sit too well with Columbus, who's counting on them to take the fall for his slave trade. Thus, to encourage them, he sets the village on fire at night, making it look like an Amazon attack. This forces us to take to the waters and head straight for El Dorado. Along the way, however, we're once again attacked by Megalos. This time, Columbus claims to have remembered his true identity, allowing him to use his noble phantasm, Santa Maria Drop Anchor, to pin down Megalos. Shit gets even more chaotic when Pent arrives to start fighting Heracles, and ultimately our ship collapses, plunging us into the waters below. We wake up at the underwater Dragon Palace and find that Dehut had survived the flooding of Ys. She's still trying to kill us, so we put an end to her and discover the Tamete Bako that can be found in the palace. Columbus figures we can force Megalos to obey our orders if Scheherazade can bind him with the Tamete Bako's mana. After all, they seem to function like small wish granters. Sadly, he also convinces us to let him be the one to control Heracles, citing it as a huge risk for Ritska should their plan fail. Clever bastard. With Megalos fighting for us, we return to El Dorado and confront Penthesilia at her palace. Thanks to our spell on Megalos, Pent thinks we're all Achilles and goes into a full-on rage. She calls upon her army surrounding the palace to join in with their war cry, but discovers they aren't responding. This is because Astolfo and Deon are standing outside the palace, holding the Amazons at bay with their Tamitebako charged noble phantasms. Astolfo's Le Black Luna is a giant hunting horn that he uses to cancel out the war cry, allowing Deon to use Flor de Lis, a sword dance that helps hold the Amazons off. Because of this, we're able to defeat Penthesilia, who realizes right before dying that she's been mistaking Heracles for Achilles this whole time. All of the city rulers have been defeated, making it a perfect time for Christopher Columbus to finally betray us, showing off his freaky fucking face. Ma! There's a strange fucking servant over here! Mashu and Da Vinci saw this coming, but decided to give the bastard the benefit of the doubt. Sadly, we weren't in contact with Caldea when we gave him control of Megalos, so now we're at a disadvantage. Thankfully, we barely managed to pull out a victory, but Columbus aims to turn the tide with yet another Tamatebako he'd been keeping secret. Just as he's about to use it, however, one of his own men fires an arrow, knocking it from his grasp. These men trusted Columbus. He taught them how to fight, he gave them hope, 
but discovering they were just pawns encouraged them to side with Caldea. This one man's effort saved us, causing Columbus and Megalos to vanish. By this point, we're confused. We figured one of these servants had been hiding a demon god this whole time, and yet none of them have. If we assume the culprit didn't come from Caldea, that leaves Scheherazade as the only remaining suspect. When we confront her, we learn about her true motive in facilitating this war. She begins her final step, harnessing the gathered mana of the fallen servants to lift Agartha out of the underground into the sky as Lapta. We fight to stop her, but Astolfo and Deon have little effect, given that she has a counter-king skill that resists not just kings, but their knights as well. We can, however, fight against Fenex, who's made himself available. Or so we think. While we defeat Fenex in battle, he is a demon god of death and rebirth, so making him stay dead proves difficult. We're stuck at this status quo until Wu Zetian appears to help us. Turns out she wasn't actually dead when Megalos fell on her. Somehow. Instead, she made use of her presence concealment as an assassin to sneak out and regain her strength. Ever since, she's been biding her time for Fenex to reveal himself. As a king, she can't hurt Scheherazade, but she can trap Fenex in her noble phantasm, Manual of Accusation, which keeps him soaked in a lake of poison to torture him relentlessly. Even so, we're running out of time and need something drastic to change the situation. Now, this entire journey, we've had little Fergus protecting Ritska from the sidelines. As a boy destined to be king, he dedicated himself to training and observed the way every woman of Agartha ruled their respective cities. He even befriended Scheherazade, exchanging their feelings on death. He was meant to be summoned in his prime, not as a child, and feels he's only played a bit part in this whole ordeal. To change that, he uses the Tamatebako they got from Columbus on himself, hoping to effectively re-summon himself in his prime while standing in Wu Zetian's poison. This doesn't suddenly make Fergus an adult, but he does gain some of his adult consciousness, restoring him to the charismatic alpha we know him as. His sword, Kaladbolg, begins to swell in a rather phallic manner, and he uses it to unleash his noble phantasm, Kalwich Kaladbolg, to stir the poison and further damage Fenex. More importantly, he confronts Scheherazade about her fear of death, noting that the only way to beat the fear of death is by living an enjoyable life that distracts you from death. He notes that if she has the power to create this massive singularity, to tell her amazing stories, she certainly has the ability to smile and actually embrace living for a change. He even offers to sleep with her so he can show her a life she's been missing out on. His speech is crude, yet surprisingly effective. As Fenix clings to his last bit of power, he reaches out to Scheherazade for help, which she refuses. This allows Fergus to land a final blow, wiping out the demon god for good. Still, Scheherazade denies Fergus's advances, saying that if she met him as an adult, she'd likely die a completely different kind of death, to which he responds that he certainly pleasured women to the point where they thought they'd die of bliss. This silly argument distracts Scheherazade as she vanishes from the singularity, pretty much proving Fergus's point. She, Fergus, and Wu Zetian vanish together, causing Lapta to start crumbling apart. Before we leave, We've got an obligation to protect the surviving men of the Resistance, but have no way to transport them to safety. This is when, finally, Elena Blavatsky shows up hoping to experience the Agartha she sought to experience in life. Too bad Columbus ruined that chance for her. Either way, she's back to her former strength with the help of a Holy Grail she found, and is able to use her flying saucer to return the men to the surface. Resolving the singularity, Ritsuko returns to Caldea, and even winds up summoning Scheherazade to fight for humanity's sake. While she's still not thrilled about the concept of dying, she is willing to put faith in Fergus's words that she can find a joy in life worth setting aside her fear. Of course, that means adult Fergus is running around Caldea trying to score with her. He may have had a point about living, but she's not prepared to face the presumed death he has in store for her. Though the way she says so with a smile implies that she might eventually take him up on the offer. Either way, that concludes the Agartha Singularity. Next time, Look forward to an entirely different experience with Shimosa, the stage of rivers of blood and mountains of corpses. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this channel, help me beat the algorithm by liking, commenting, and sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of my anime discussion, lore, or let's play content. If you want to support me directly, there are now three ways that all provide the same benefits. You can click join here on YouTube, or join Patreon or Subscribestar for access to exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate your fandom!